I am Valentin Fuster from New York. I am editor in chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, or JAC. We are all very pleased to have a presentation today in this session entitled Patient Care Pathways. Let me introduce the panelists. We have uh, three outstanding uh, panelists from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Joshua Scala, Dr. James Howick, and Dr. Matthew Reed. And then we have an associate editor of Jack, Dr. Ty Glugman. And then we have the editor in chief of Jack Imaging, Dr. Uh, Chandra Shaker. And then the editor in chief of uh, Jack Case Reports, Dr. Julia Grabser. And then an associate editor of Jack uh, Case Reports, Dr. Rafael Vidal Perez. Well, we are going to present a case is entitled Cardiac Arrest After Stem Cell Transplantation. You probably are thinking what is going on here. You are going to see in the next few minutes a number of issues very interesting in clinical practice that we face. But let's move with this title. And now I am asking uh, Dr. Howick to start uh, the presentation of the case. Uh, James? Thank you, Dr. Fuster. So this is a 64 year old male. He had a witnessed out of hospital cardiac arrest. Bystander CPR was initiated immediately. And when emergency medical services arrives about 10 to 15 minutes later, they still do not feel a pulse. ROSC was achieved after four rounds of CPR. And when the patient arrives to our emergency department, he's responsive and he's able to verbalize that he has chest pain. So some background about this patient. He has a history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of the left thigh. This was treated with chemotherapy two years ago. He had recent recurrence of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which was eventually confirmed on pathology, but you'll see here that there's the development of an intensely hypermetabolic soft tissue mass in the left posterior aspect uh, of his thigh here. This was treated with a myeloablative conditioning regimen and subsequent autologous stem cell transplant four days prior to this arrest. And the ultimate plan was to have adjuvant radiation therapy to the left thigh 60 days after stem cell transplant. For his prior cardiac history, he has stable angina. It was refractory to medical management. So he had a stent placed in the LAD in 2018. And here's his pre-stem cell transplant echo and you see a preserved ejection fraction of 64%, normal LV global longitudinal strain, and no regional wall motion abnormalities. So back to the emergency department. On physical exam, the patient's afebrile's blood pressure is 171 over 107, tachycardic at 119. He's adding 87% in his tachypnic. He looked distressed and diaphoretic. There's no murmurs or peripheral edema. So initial investigations here, he's found to be pancytopenic and is thought to, he's going to have worsening of this during engraftment. We see the platelets and neutrophils are quite low there. And on his basic metabolic panel, he is hypokalemic. He has a bicarb of 16, creatinine of 1.03 and a normal glucose. His lactate's markedly elevated at 11 and he's acidotic. And here's the chest x-ray. You see the central venous catheter here that was placed in anticipation of the stem cell transplant. He also has some diffuse opacities bilaterally, thought to be related to either edema or pneumonitis. And finally, there's no pneumothoraces or rib fractures from the CPR. And here's the presentation ECG here. So what do you think about the ECG? James, comments? Yeah, so one thing we notice is in AVR, we see ST elevation subtly there and diffuse depressions throughout. Um, and with this, the concern was with the prior history of, you know, with the stent placement was for acute ischemia. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can continue.
So STEMI was activated on arrival. He received aspirin 324 milligrams and Plavix and heparin were deferred due to the thrombocytopenia. And here's an image from his angiography. And within this, we see that we have an acute lesion in the, in the LAD there. Okay, so I'll, I'll take over from here. Uh, so we have a, a, an acute looking uh, thrombotic distal LED lesion with Timmy flow distal to the lesion um, in a patient who is pancytopenic and who had a prior arrest that was noted to be PEA. Um, this got us to the first branch point of the case, which is, uh, which uh, Dr. Fuster, I don't know if you want to ask the panel, but how, how would you treat this? Should we stent? Should we balloon? Do we think that there's another etiology here? Um, I, I invite the, the panel for any comments. Well, let's have a first question. Okay, he's a patient, has a cardiac arrest, and you show an electrocardiogram, show ST depression, which could be, who knows, related to the shock, or could be ischemic, but you know, it has been a great controversy in the literature that after cardiac arrest, should you do a cardiac catheterization? And here's my first question, because the guidelines say, if the patient is not unstable, you might wait for, a, for about a few days. If the patient is unstable, you should do a cath right away. So my first question, before we go into the type of modality that you use to open this artery, is do you think it was appropriate to do the catheterization uh, right, right away? If, if I could say something, I, I, I was wondering in the case uh, after a cardiac arrest with the, the prior clinical history of the patient, maybe now it's easy to have uh, access even to a pocket echo. Why rush to the card lab now have more information about the patient, about what is going on with the heart with an echocardiography? This is one of the burning questions after this kind of cardiac arrest. We don't have a uh, pulse activity. So maybe it could add more information what to do. Maybe you have a chest enlargement on the X-ray maybe there is something going on with the pericardium. I don't know. I think I, I, I will not rush to the cat laugh and get more info with an echo. I don't know what the other members of the panel Yeah, think. I can only say to you that uh, if you go to guidelines, there is a question here about this patient having done so early. However, there's an article on Jack actually uh, published from uh, a group in Switzerland three weeks ago. Now that you did the right thing because some patients that are appear to be stable, they have coronary occlusions. And therefore, you should open up as quickly as possible. So you are targeting a patient with a reasonably stable condition after cardiac arrest. One out of four, 25% have a coronary occlusion. So to wait is not worth it. So I think the right thing was done. The, the now way, comes the second question. Yeah, any any comments? Yeah, the way I would look at it is the the need to rush to the cath lab is ST elevation. So most most papers say that if you don't have ST elevation MI, taking to the cath lab doesn't seem to change right. uh, overall cardiac arrest outcomes. Uh, but here there was more than that. The patient was complaining of active chest pain. There is ischemia in pretty much every lead, and it's pretty significant ST depression. The AVR elevation kind of raises the question, is there multivessel disease or left main? So I would be very uncomfortable not taking him to the cath lab. So that's what I would do. But I also agree there is enough time for us to get a quick echo and see what exactly is happening. And that would be very useful. It's a good comment, Chandra. I think this case uh, was very, uh, I would say, attractive to go quite quickly anyway, exactly. for the reasons you mentioned. OK, let's continue. Now you have the question, uh, do you stand on somebody who has a platelet count that is very low? Or you do angioplasty thinking on the anticoagulation? What do you people think, uh, Josh or 
Omato, what do you think? So we agree with everything that uh, has been said to this point. You know, the patient was complaining with chest pain and the STEMI was activated in the ED based on AVR and the diffuse ST depressions. So we did feel like this was a culprit lesion and did warrant treatment. Based on the pancytopenia with project, we talked with hemo hematology oncology and we knew that his pancytopenia was projected to worsen. So we opted to do just balloon angioplasty. Yeah, it's, okay. a, it's a tricky situation, right? Yeah. So even if you do balloon angioplasty, you're going to give DAPT for two weeks at least, right? So the immediate period is not protected. The, the, by avoiding the stent, we are reducing the total length of DAPT but not the immediate need for DAP for a couple of weeks. There could also be a technical reason as you go so distally into the LAD, it looks like this is after three diagonals. The vessel size is small and maybe putting a 2.5 stand there doesn't make sense. So all in all, ballooning that area and waiting and seeing what happens is probably the best course. Okay. So what was done and what anticoagulation was used, if any? So at this point, he just received aspirin 324. We proceeded with balloon angioplasty. You can see here that um, we were able to open up the distal LAD, uh, but we do lose that um, diagonal branch that had disease at the ostium. Now, no further intervention was done due to the fact that we wanted the short duration of antiplatelet and both the distal LED and that diagonal were thought to be small vessels. And there was other things that we wanted to treat, including his electrolyte abnormalities and his lactic acidosis and look for other possible contributing factors to his arrest. Okay, so tell us what happened. So he came to the CCU after a balloon angioplasty and was tachycardic but stable. He was able to re recall the events prior to the rest and afterwards. His chest pain had resolved and he was just on a little bit of uh, oxygen but uh, wasn't taking very deep breaths. Uh, we can see that his pancytopenia was basically unchanged. He had severe neutropenia. Yeah. His electrolyte abnormalities had corrected. His lactate was downtrending. And his VBG was not not very impressive um, with a pH of 7.3. Can I ask a question, Dr. Fuster? Yeah. The, the EKG changes are disproportionate to the angiographic <laughs> findings. Uh, while it makes sense to open a, a occluded vessel in the setting of chest pain and a cardiac arrest, uh, probably may not be explaining the whole picture there. Uh, EKG changes are far disproportionate to the coronary artery lesion. I, I tend to agree with you. Can you go show the EKG again, please? Can you go backwards? You know, all the leads are affected. Yeah. Uh, the question you, you have to ask, and this is one of the issues, actually, it's very nice you ask, is all talking about ischemia, obviously coronary artery disease, uh, chest pain, but who knows if there's something else like myocarditis or something else here. Yeah. Looking at the EKG, this is, this is, as you mentioned, is very, very extensive. I was going to comment about this later on, but is interesting, it's an interesting point. Uh, I don't know, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, that, that's what we thought as well. You know, he's, this is after an arrest. It looks like he has diffuse subendocardial ischemia. We ruled out kind of left main disease with our angiogram. And that was the other reason that pushed us um, to just do balloon angioplasty um, because we thought that there was possibly another etiology at play here. What about the electrolytes? I don't know, the hypokaline, it could go with this or not? What do you think? 
Uh, we didn't think that just the hypokalemia was enough to explain these ECG changes, but that is something that we corrected right away, um, even before the patient got to the cath lab. Okay, let's move on, see what happened here. So we left off after ballooning, the patient returned to the CCU, he was chest pain free. We uh, got a repeat ECG after, um, after his lactate started downtrending, his uh, electrolytes were re uh, repleted and after the intervention. And we can see that um, the elevation AVR has decreased. The ST depressions that were so widely seen have improved. He does have that Q wave in three, but otherwise no uh, large Q waves or signs of infarct. And so overall, uh, we thought that we were heading in the right direction. And of course we had a patient who was very grateful and, and happy in front of us. So we started looking for other uh, things with his severe neutropenia. We covered him broadly for uh, with antimicrobials and antifungals. We started talking with uh, all the other appropriate teams and within an hour, he developed recurrent chest pressure that he felt was similar to what he had pre arrest. And you can see the ECG changes again are very, um, very dramatic. We have elevation again in AVR and diffuse ST depressions uh, in a patient who's having recurrent chest pain. And we just saw that he had a, a distal LED thrombotic lesion. Before we could do anything else, he went into a uh, pulseless monomorphic VT and we immediately started defibrillation and high quality CPR for him. It's interesting, this EKG is very similar to the previous one. Yeah. It's not correct. Yeah. So if, yeah. the, if the occluded LAV was the cause of the previous one, this should be an occluded LAV. Is not correct? Mm. Makes sense, yeah. yeah. At least it seems to me, no? Julia, yeah. what do you think? I was uh, thinking actually that at some point I would, as Rafa said before, I would, I would need to see the echo. And if, uh, you know, the patient's regionals have, are proportionate to the ECG, but now the patient has gone to VT. So I think we have to rush him to the cath lab again to see exactly how is his LAD. I agree with you. Okay, let's move on. So again, we started CPR and we kind of break off into two teams here. Uh, we have a code team that is leading the resuscitation efforts, looking for reversible causes, thinking if there was anything that we missed. And then we have another team that is starting to engage with our ECMO colleagues, as well as our hematology oncology uh, colleagues. And trying to think through the next best steps. One thing that was on everyone's mind, if you go to the next slide was, could this be a, um, a cardiotoxic effect of his myeloablative uh, chemotherapy? Um, we didn't readily have that answer to us, but I just put this slide in to review the chemotherapy that he had just uh, a few months prior, and then his auto, uh, his conditioning chemotherapy that he had. <laughs> Now, based on uh, literature review that we've seen afterwards, don't really think that there was an offending agent based on this uh, regimen, and Hemonc didn't think so based on our initial uh, discussion with them in the moment. So at this point, uh, I was called to evaluate the patient for um, ECMO in the setting of his recurrent cardiac arrest. Uh, when we got to the patient, uh, he had been receiving quality compressions, appropriate ACLS, and uh, immediately got the story about his history of, uh, of neoplasm, his um, stem cell therapy, and kind of the events that he had already underwent that we've discussed. And at this point, there's several concerns about putting him on ECMO. Uh, we need to, one, do we have a reversible cause that we've identified? Uh, two, um, what are the risks of putting him on in the setting of his pancytopenia and just the setting of cancer itself? And so we, at this point, initiated a multidisciplinary discussion with the hematology team, cardiology, um, and our ECMO team. And ultimately, 
uh, decided that we would cannulate him for ECMO, we certainly thought there was a component of, uh, you know, ischemia, uh, structural issue that we needed to return to the cath lab for, and this was really going to be our only avenue to get him to the cath lab. So he went to the cath lab and um, again, uh, showing the, the uh, angiogram here and, and I'll let uh, Josh describe that as this is certainly his uh, area of expertise and not mine. So at this point, the patient was cannulated on ECMO. He's also on an epi epinephrine trip. And so we see a diffuse um, coronary spasm on the epinephrine, but the distal LED is uh, still perfusing. There's a uh, flow there. That diagonal branch uh, is not well seen, but it does look like it is starting to uh, recanalize based on this uh, side image here on the arrow. The um, Otherwise, no culprit uh, that we readily saw on this uh, coronary angiogram. Well, I'd like to, to uh, before you go any further, and I, I want to hear really an idea here. What is happening to this patient? Did he wave inversions all over the place on the first cardiac arrest? And uh, beyond what you might consider an occluded distal LAV, then the EKG, all changes return to normal after the uh, opening of the LED. And now the EKG is the same after the second cardiac arrest. So the LED should be occluded. And now it turns out it is not. And you find a diagonal branch. Uh, Ty Gluckman, you, you are a good brain. Tell us what's happening here. I, I got to tell you, it's very disheartening to sort of come up with a cogent argument as to what's going on. Uh, I will say that, you know, you had a couple of slides back, you had highlighted, is this true, true and unrelated? Is ischemia not the cause of this? Is it cardiotoxic? Hard to sort of make that connection given the, the abrupt changes that this patient has gone through. Dr. Fuster, I agree with you completely. I, you know, you're fully expecting somebody who's gone to the lab already um, to have their LID compromised and significant compromise given their the, the the hemodynamic insults that they're uh, um, facing right now. So I'm hard pressed and I'd be going back and saying beyond the hemodynamic support that's been, uh, that got this patient to the cath lab, I'd be still searching to try and figure out and make sense of this because I'm having a hard time making good sense of it right now. Thank you. Uh, Chandra, what is your thinking? Uh, yeah, I personally think the distal LED is probably not related to the cardiac arrest. Uh, it, uh, it, there's too many changes going on, so I have to think about what's happening. Cardiotoxicity make, may make sense, but you, you have to invoke a spasm through cardiotoxicity rather than a myocardial damage through cardiotoxicity because these EKG changes are coming and going. What I would like to know is, one, I'm assuming the other arteries don't have flow-limiting stenosis, even though they were not completely occluded. If there's tight three-vessel disease, uh, some of that may be in play. I'm assuming they are not tightly narrowed. We haven't yes. seen those pictures. And what I would also like to know is what happened to the EKG after you took him back from the cath lab the second time? Did the EKG <laughs> settle down? That would make me think about some global spastic phenomena rather than the distal LAD lesion or even cardiotoxicity of the usual client. Some cardiac dr uh, toxicity drugs do cause vasospasm, but none of the ones listed on this list. Julie, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen after shock, uh, you know, defibrillating a patient to develop all these changes in the electrocardiogram? Because, you know, after the shock, there are changes in the electrocardiogram and just and both EKGs are just actual after the shock. So have you seen that so severe, so significant? Not so significant changes, Dr. Fuster. Usually, you know, we see that the heart is in, uh, in shock and there are some changes, but here we have profound depression all over. It was exactly this, as, the, as you said, exactly like the initial ECG. So I'm quite surprised to see that. I would like to see an echo, of course, uh, to see, you know, how is the ejection fraction? 
Uh, especially now that they have uh, put the ECMO in, we are we need to see you know some echo images as well. So the echo people are very anxious here. Okay, let's continue with the case. You opened that diagonal. What did you do? No coronary intervention was done here. Uh, after reviewing it with Dr. Reed um, from the ECMO side and with hematology oncology and the fact that he was on EPI. Uh, we agreed with everything that the, our panelists has said, and there was no um, flow limiting coronary uh, stenosis in any other arteries, very uh, minimal to mild disease in the RCA or the CERC. Okay. So move on. So uh, just expanding the differential, you know, PE was certainly on the differential. So we did a PA angiogram, which didn't show any hemodynamically significant PE burden. Um, and then we have the, you know, our, our SWAN uh, numbers here, um, just looking at the, the hemodynamics through the case. And then to speak to the other, you know, differential, certainly septic shock was uh, something that was uh, considered. And, you um, uh, and so, you know, we didn't really have this differentiated at this point, but we certainly agreed this wasn't uh, isolated to just the, the LAD um, defect at this point. So I think our next few slides have some echo images. Let Julia uh, interpret them. So now we're talking, you know, <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, and um, that just we see, you know, a stand uh, ventricle, like it's uh, the, reject the ejection fraction is. Uh, less than 30%, I would say 20, 15, 20% severely impaired LV. And uh, we can see that the, the RV is, uh, is small, uh, it's like col almost collapsing. And um, of course, just to remind that when we insert the ECMO, we have to make sure that there is no acute aortic regurgitation. And I think uh, here uh, we will see the next images that um, there is also with color. Here is what we are expecting to see that, uh, you know, there is no AR and, uh, of course, no MR. So interesting. I think the, this is what we expect, that the ventricle is um, severely impaired. This is uh, the short axis on the terms of agial echo. And uh, again, it shows them. Um, I think uh, here we can see uh, that there is uh, trying to improve is still stand, um, but um, a thickened ventricle uh, here it's uh, on the right is starts a little bit of improvement. Maybe it's at the end of the angiogram. Uh, so there is a like you had the TE while you were doing the angiogram. Is that correct? That's correct. We had the TE probe in through the cath lab case uh, to assess. Um, all of the things that you've mentioned. Uh, Julia, can you tell us about the right ventricle? So the right ventricle seemed uh, a little bit collapsed. There was, I think, the, the view that, uh, so I would love to see more. Um, I, I think also that's why it was not, uh, an important thing is that, of course, they, they did the differential for PE, which was the right, as uh, the patient had the cardiac arrest. Uh, however, we didn't see the traditional ballooned RV pressure overloaded that we see in an acute PE patient. So if uh, someone was doing a portable bedside echo, they would see that the RV is small, non-dilated, not pressure or volume overloaded. Uh, that it, it makes initially the first suggestion that is not PE. Yes, but my question was going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Are we dealing with myocarditis here? because or toxic effects, because then both ventricles might be affected rather than the left ventricle, which is more coronary dependent. That's the reason why I was asking. So I couldn't see any significant deterioration of the RV in function. So definitely if uh, there is something, it has affected only the left ventricle and not the right that much. So the right, it was small and the, the function was overall good from what I saw in the limited images from transesophageal echo. 
So Chandra, what do you think? Uh, the right ventricle doesn't appear to be very affected. So one has to think more about the coronary situation here. Again, since you mentioned coronary spasm, I'd like you to give a little bit more thought. What do you think after this presentation of the echo, Chandra? And then Tai, I'm going to ask you the same question. <laughs> the ventricular wall is thick, which could happen in myocarditis also. So it might be good to go back and see if it was thick even before the transplant. Or is this thickness because of edema? So that would be one way to look at it. I do not see any regional wall motion abnormalities. So that doesn't fit like a distal LAD STEMI. Uh, myocarditis is still in the, in the uh, differential diagnosis, but I'm leaning more towards something global, uh, global ischemia, maybe spasm or something related to that. I still don't have a good answer at this stage. Hi. And I, I have a similar view. I mean, this really speaks to a global process. There's no focality to uh, the wall motion abnormalities here. Even going back to the ele original electrocardiogram, although there was ST segment elevation lead AVR and trying to make an argument that this was an ischemia-driven mechanism, I think you could clearly say that the ECG is reflective of a diffuse hypoperfusion. And the question that I don't know the answer to is, is this due... And it was not purely a hemodynamic phenomenon early on. Now, certainly, that's a contributor given what the person's blood pressure is when this when this is being assessed. Um, but I, I have a hard time knowing whether this is a diffuse non-ischemia-related mechanism or ischemia um, is at hand. I know it was mentioned about septic shock. Clinically, one should be able to differentiate, uh, you know, whether the patient's warmer and well perfused or is all clamped down as to whether this is a primary cardiac or secondary phenomenon. Um, but obviously, a, a concurrent evaluation given the patient's underlying uh, recent transplant status and pancytopenia is going to be important as well. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see what is happening next because the, the, the question is with, with the two cardiac arrests, uh, could be these left ventricle related something to the ECMO? So definitely being on peripheral VA ECMO, it's going to increase the afterload to the left ventricle. Um, and uh, if you're not um, venting the left ventricle or you don't have appropriate ejection, it's going to impair your myocardial perfusion. Uh, and so that could certainly contribute. I think our next, um, if we can go to the next slide. I think this is the issue. The reason I'm mentioning this is because at least this is, uh, I don't know if so severe like here, but with ECMO is very well known. You can create a pressure overload in a compromised left ventricle and ending up with a low ejection fraction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, unfortunately, we don't have the arterial waveforms here, but um, before we left the, um, the cath lab, you know, we of course had the discussion about placing um, an impella or other vent for the LV. And at that point he had, uh, you know, at least 30 to 40 points of pulsatility um, and um, and so we felt at that point that we didn't need to place the vent. So we um, we left the cath lab um, and we were able to, um, you know, on full uh, flows, uh, we actually were able to start coming down on some of his inotropic and vasopressor support. Um, but unfortunately, shortly after arrival to the CVICU, he lost pulsatility and we went back to the cath lab for in place uh, placement of an impella CP for uh, use of an LV vent. And then um, this is uh, just, I think. Before, um, before, you, before sure. you go any further, I didn't hear. Rafael, do you have any comments about the use of impella in this particular situation? Well, we have the problem of, of all the anticoagulation that we will need for all these devices that are coming on that we, we I think we will discuss after for the VECMO and also the Impella. I don't know if other options on this case could be instead of Impella, I don't know, intraarticular pump, it seems not the best of option for a shock, also for the loads of the ventricle. So 
it's, it's, it's a tricky situation, but I think one of the big doubts is what to do for the next days with the anticoagulation in this thrombopenic patient. That's one of the main issues. But of course, the situation of shock is demanding some solutions. Okay, so let's move on. High dose in inotropic support and impeller placement. Okay, Julia, can you come back to the echo now? Yes, here we see a different ventricle. So now the impeller is offloading the LV and there is immediately better contractility of the left ventricle. Um, I mean, again, uh, like I agree about the global uh you know uh, global contract that it's global issue i have there is no doubt but definitely the contractility is better than before okay so let's let's go next So these are the things that we, you know, continue to to work up and do for the patient um, after we had uh, uh, put him on ECMO and had the vent in place. Um, we did start him on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, so Grassum was recommended. We actually did not um, start it because it wasn't approved before the point at which he started to uh, improve. Um, and then we decided to um, to use a heparin infusion for our anticoagulation and. And as you mentioned, um, certainly there's risk with his pancytopenia and using the anticoagulation is increased risk of bleeding. Uh, at this point, we felt like uh, we were able to at least initiate it um, and see if he would tolerate it, uh, knowing that there may be a chance that we would have to stop it. But uh, certainly in our experience with postcardiotomy and in uh, experience with trauma, burn patients, there's certainly Plenty of instances where anticoagulation is not being used with mechanical circulatory support. Uh, and so uh, that was all the thoughts that kind of went into our decision making for this patient. Now, can I ask you uh, step by step, uh, were you thinking you have a broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, the reason? Again, um, just sepsis given his neutropenia um, and still not fully differentiated cause for for his hemodynamic you thought, compromise. You thought could be septic? Potentially. I see. A at any time, it occurred to you to use, to use corticosteroids? Um, I believe he did have a dose of stress, dose corticosteroids. Um, at some point, um, I can't recall exactly when, but I, I do know that we did give stress dose steroids. I am talking possibility of myocarditis. That's the only reason why I'm asking. No, I think just given the echo findings that we had and, you know, we had discussed myocarditis, we didn't feel like that was, uh, you know, high on our differential. Understand it. Understand it. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Just, um, I wouldn't have said that the left ventricle appeared distended on the initial one, but it looks smaller or more normal in size. And clearly contractility was better after being vented. I assume hemodynamics appreciably improved as well, concurrent with venting. Absolutely. Um, you know, he was uh, not only vented, but then able to, you know, have a good pulse pressure uh, to have good ejection through his aortic valve. Um, and so every, everything improved. Um, you know, what occurred from the time that we left the cath lab to returning to the, to the ICU that he lost pulsatility again, you know, is it a global vasospasm event um, or just global malperfusion? Um, that's leading to this, um, you know, again, at this point, we still don't know. Okay. Yes. Can I ask a question? Was he ever hypotensive when he was not on, in the arrest phase? Looks like his blood pressures were otherwise okay, correct? That is correct. He actually came in after the initial arrest and was hypertensive in the 170s systolic. And upon arrival to the CCU, he was normal tensive again. Right, right. So I mean, so it's not like sepsis-related hypoperfusion at first glance, also, right? Okay. 
Yeah. One of the things with the broad spectrum antibiotics, though, that we, uh, Dr. Reed and team discussed was that the the fact that the ECMO circuit could mask fevers. And since there was that in uncertainty in a patient with severe neutropenia, uh, that's why we thought uh, to continue antibiotics in that cir circumstance. Makes sense, makes sense. Thank you, uh, move on. So as, as everyone's kind of alluded to, we weren't uh, completely sold on a single unifying diagnosis here. And we had our echocardiogram, um, the TE during the cath lab. Uh, the echocardiogram after impella placement, we saw some improvement with broad spectrum antibiotics, and we did a CT scan. Uh, there was no signs of intrapulmonary pathology. He had small bilateral effusions. The heart size appeared to be normal. Everything was in uh, the correct place, and he didn't have any sustained injuries from the prolonged CPR. But one interesting fact that we can discuss on the next slide is the CT does um, several, it was done several days out, but it does show some perfusion uh, defects here, subendocardial along the anterior and anterior lateral wall. And also we thought that we saw it on the uh, antero, antero lateral papillary muscle consistent with a large uh, LAD infarct almost. Um, of course, that doesn't correspond to what we saw on the angiogram, but one hypothesis we had was he may have potentially thrombosed his proximal LAD stent and, and before it, and then recanalized before uh, we ever saw it angiographically. I invite the panel if, if they have any comments on that. Comments? Or it could be an old infarct, right? right. So it doesn't tell us when this infarct happened. It probably could be something that was pre-existent. Uh, if it had, if it was a thrombosis and re and uh, recanalized on its own, and caused those EKG changes, it happened the next time when the when the artery was completely open. So I would think it's more of a global ischemic phenomena either something systemic that's reducing the blood flow or a local spasm that's reducing the blood flow. Yeah, the, what you're saying, there's no time to have an infarct. Exactly. <laughs> or maybe an old one. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense. And, uh, and that other... leads us back to our re-look re re at the differential of looking back at his chemotherapy agents and looking at the <laughs> literature there. Nothing that he had received really seemed to be uh, positively corresponding to um, mm -hmm. coronary spasm. Um, iphosphamide has been associated with LV dysfunction and cyclo and sometimes pericarditis, but we didn't think that that was evident here. And cisplatin has been seen with late onset uh, cardiotoxicity, but we thought uh, in the literature myocardial infarction is pretty uncommon there. So I think we can go to the next slide here, Jimmy. So overall, with um, ECMO support, with the Impella uh, LV vent, uh, he did continue to improve. Our infectious workup really didn't reveal any viral pathogens for possibility of myocarditis or any bacterial fungal pathogens. Um, and as I just mentioned, we didn't really uh, have a clear correlation between his the chemotherapy that he received or the conditioning he received with coronary spasm, myocarditis, or cardiotoxicity. And Jimmy, if you uh, advance to the next slide, we can see that his EF um, rapidly improved here. Many days after the impella is uh, this echo? This is uh, the uh, the next day after the impella is removed. One, one question, if we have this CT, because it's probably not possible to do an MRI, did you think on doing an MRI some days after on the patient? Yeah, there, there was discussion of that, but uh, to be honest, I'm not sure why it was never pursued. Um, I think we were just all thrilled with the recovery that he had. Okay. 
Also, I want to note that he uh, was on peripheral ECMO for three days and then had the impella um, for several days thereafter. So this echo is without any mechanical support. Okay, is any of you can summarize the case? Jimmy, if you go to the next slide, please. So overall, we have a patient who is three days out from an autologous stem cell transplant who came in with a presumed PA arrest but had chest pain before the arrest and afterwards and signs of diffuse uh, subendocardial ischemia on ECG and a distal LAD uh, lesion that does not explain his presentation or his repeat arrest. However, he did uh, continue to improve after angioplasty and after broad spectrum antibiotics. And ultimately, although no unifying diagnosis was really found uh, through the multidisciplinary care he received from cardiology, the emergency department, uh, hematology, oncology, and of course our critical care and uh, anesthesia and ECMO colleagues, uh, we were happy to say that this patient did make a, a good recovery. So in follow-up, uh, you know, the patient uh, did not have any significant neurologic defects and uh, was able to ambulate on his own and complete uh, cardio-oncology rehab. He was continued on anticoagulation uh, because of a catheter-associated thrombus, and he was started on uh, therapy for a presumed LED infarct, and he did have a reduced EF with a beta blocker and ACE. He was discharged 16 days, uh, on hospital day 16, excuse me, and um, actually completed cardiac rehab. And on uh, 60 days out from hospitalization, he is in complete remission and has responded very favorably to his stem cell transplant. So it seems to me that uh, this is a case that um... The right things were done without knowing exactly the etiology, which is interesting. And you end up with a normal ventricle, or at least in terms of contractility, and it's, it's quite fascinating. And still, there's a big question mark. So here we have summary points. Julia, can you can you give your view, and perhaps the others can can comment on? Yes, Doctor Fuster. I think it's remarkable that the authors actually, first of all, resuscitate the cancer patient with multiple uh, therapeutic schemes in the past uh, after stem cell transplant with uh, an ECMO after the second arrest. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, the first patient to be reported. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, this is the multidisciplinary approach that we need in this uh, JAK patient care pathways. Also, it uh, was impressive that they the way that they anticoagulate, you know, the, the way that they used heparinization and uh, antibiotics in a pancytopenic patient. Then we discussed, uh, of course, extensively the ischemic burden of the patient, but also that the uh, ECG changes were disproportional to what we saw in the angiogram. And of course, uh, then uh, the role of impella in offloading um, the LV and uh, recovering an LV. And um, always we discussed extensively about the differential diagnosis that, uh, you know, we need to think about cardiotoxicity, myocarditis, uh, spasm, um, when the patient had the cardiac arrest and, of course, on the second cardiac arrest. Um, I, I think, you know, it's very interesting. Maybe the, the, the authors to, to discuss about ECMO in, in a cancer patient and, of course, uh, the rest of the panel, what do they think? I think one of the important points is this one of the ECMO on a cancer patient. But I think when you went to the multidisciplinary discussion, when you plan a bone marrow transplant, it's because you are thinking on curing the disease. So I think it's not so a not recuperable patient. So it's what the point of hematology sometimes maybe you could be more aggressive. But I think it's one of the most important points is that ECMO is there in these patients too. 
that is a good thing to know on the whole thing if you have information of prognosis of the hematologist or oncologist it depends on the case and that was one of the first questions that we asked uh was to get in touch with the hematologist uh you know what is the prognosis for this patient he was deemed healthy enough to undergo stem cell transplant they felt that he had uh, excellent chance at remission we still have undifferentiated cause for this uh and uh, if you look at a lot of the literature, you know, uh, ECMO is being used more and more for in patients with neoplasm. And it's not that, uh, you know, it's specific to neoplasm. It's just going up proportionally with the increased use of ECMO overall in, in the population. Um, but the survival with all comers of neoplasm is actually pretty decent, around 40%. And that's for all types of ECMO, all types of neoplasm. <laughs> Um, and so we certainly felt that this patient warranted the efforts uh, and, and the institution of ECMO to try and get him through this. And I would say, um, you know, from my perspective, we talk about multidisciplinary care an awful lot, but we usually don't talk about multidisciplinary care in emergent situations. And uh, on multiple time points in this patient's care, uh, team-based discussion about next best steps um, Went, went really, really well. And so I think a, a testament to all of you that were involved in the patient's care. I think the second thing is this is a good example of the value, the clinical value afforded by venting or the consequences that can happen in somebody on ECMO without venting. Again, I'm reinforcing Dr. Fuster's point. It's um, disheartening that we don't have a unifying diagnosis to give this patient or explain this. And I would just say that um, he got better despite all of that, um, and which is great to hear, but it's just, it's a, it's just, you know, one would like to have a good explanation of what's going on, if nothing else, for ourselves and for the patient as well. So uh, I should congratulate the team for the outstanding uh, outcomes here, even though we didn't know what the cause was. Uh, what what is impressive is. Uh, this could not have been possible without what, what you put together like a shock team or a cardiac arrest team. And we are seeing this more and more. Uh, we are one of the big centers here in Minnesota for ECMO in cardiac arrest. And it's really changing the way we are thinking about cardiac arrest. It gives us more time to think and it gives us more time to take all the necessary steps uh, in this patient like they did. Uh, I was also intrigued that uh, doing all this in a patient with platelets in the 40,000 range uh, and pancytopenia and the outcomes ended up much better than what I would have thought. In fact, I, I heard that there may have been a coagulation incident rather than a bleeding incident. So that's also is very interesting to see. I would have loved to have a pre-discharge CMR. Uh, the T2 values... Uh, persist for some time. The late gadolinium enhancement patterns would have been very informative. Uh, even if it is late now, it, it might still make sense to get a CMR and see if he still has an infarct in a distribution that's entirely different than what EKG said. Nice case. I, I agree, actually. A CMR somehow may provide some clues. I don't know which clues, but but certainly is a sophisticated tool in situations like this and looking at the myocardium anyway. So let's uh, have a final comment, Julia. Again, we all congratulate you know, the authors for uh, the management of this patient. Uh, it's remarkable how they escalate the management in a patient who arrested twice. And um, again, to emphasize the multidisciplinary component of this uh, case, and uh, that uh, finally the LV function was restored, you know, with ECMO and Impella. And the patient, of course, um, is uh, in great shape and he managed to go home uh, and have a successful discharge. So um, that's uh, the point of Jack uh, patient care pathways, uh, the acute presentation, the multidisciplinary uh, team approach. Dr. Fuster. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Well, I just like to say again, congratulations to uh, to the group uh, at Mayo, who, where this patient was, an institution that had the opportunity to work there for 12 years. Uh, is an institution in which uh, 
if I have to characterize is, is because of the team effort. In this case is the team effort in an acute setting and it's fascinating and my congratulations, of course, but also to congratulate the rest of the of the panelists here, because I think this has been a very interesting discussion. I was looking for a, an etiology uh, to uh, in moving, moving, but the fact of the matter, everything that was said was absolutely correct. We didn't end up with an etiology, but I think the discussion was quite educational and, and so the patient. So I think we should congratulate everybody in the panel and certainly the group at Mayo who were able to to, to get this patient out and, uh, and in good health. Only question, I agree with Chandra, I would like to see an MRI. <laughs> I'm still trying to pursue an etiology somehow. Anyway, thank you very much to all of you and uh, we appreciate it. It's a very nice uh, way to start the, this meeting of the American College of Cardiology this year in New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you for, for the opportunity. Us. Thanks.